items on the agenda. So H1 for <coughs> fly emergency spillway will be going first, and then Paul Ryan from SAWA will be going second. Okay. Any other additions? Seeing none, we have a motion to approve. So All in favor? Opposed? No minutes. Okay, let's do H1, pages 7 to 12. First fly emergency still. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, following uh, Monday meeting with the uh, regional Stormwater Drainage Committee. Um, it came to light that uh, uh, there was some ACP funding of, uh, available for the CW Alberta Community Partnership funding to help fund the preliminary engineering that would take this project into phase two of the federal and provincial funding. Uh, Horsefly Emergency Spillway is uh, uh, Morris is throwing me off. Sorry. Okay, I'll go back. Um, in 2014, the committee, the Southern Regional Drainage Committee, was struck, and uh, several municipalities from left between Lethbridge and uh, uh, the city of Medicine Hat, and everybody inclusive of that area, has been working on a stormwater management plan that uh, would help alleviate chronic flooding issues in the southern region. The, a study was completed by MBE Engineering that identified approximately $151 million worth of work that needs to be done on the entire basin to bring it up to a standard where we wouldn't have to worry about development flood prone areas and those types of things. One project identified as a major uh, uh, source for, or area for relief was the horse, horse fly reservoir. It was number one on the priority list and it would have far reaching benefits to complete this work based on being able to uh, have water spill into the Old Man River safely without uh, allowing or worrying about breaches in the canal system when it's receiving stormwater during flood events from major rainfall or melting events. The horsefly reservoir portion of the 151 million is approximately $47 million and a expression of interest was submitted uh, done under the, uh, the DMAAF, which is the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. That application was sent in in the fall, and it was uh, approved to go to the second round of funding. During that second round of funding, there's approximately $78,000 worth of preliminary engineering that needs to be done. That includes a phase one environmental assessment, a project location map, indigenous concern mapping, indigenous communications log, mitigation and adaptation plans, strategies and frameworks, land acquisition attestation, climate lens and greenhouse gas assessment. So those items add up to about $78,000. In the regional committee, there's about approximately 14 partners identified that would, do, that would share in that uh, $78,000. However, there is funding available through the province for community partnership. So the request came out of that meeting to uh, apply for funding to cost share on the $78,000. So the county's portion of uh, whatever was remaining would be 1 14th of that funding application. Going forward, if the project was to be approved, um, the federal and provincial con contribution equate to about $35 million, and there's still $12 million left of unfunded uh, work on the horsefly spill rate that we would have to get into negotiations with the other 14 partners to determine how we're going to fund that $12 million. The suggestion is right now is 
an assessment based model where the land that is within the flood region is uh, taken into account what assessment is included in those areas. So that would have a higher value on uh, irrigation land versus dry land. It would have a higher value on commercial land versus um, dry pasture, those type of things. So that's the model that we're working on now. There are no agreements in place yet for that $12 million. All we're doing today is putting in a funding application to fund $78,000 to get this project into the next phase of the major funding to try to get the $35 million. Question? Any questions? <clears throat> so I guess, Rick, what are the real benefits to us? Like, when I look at this, uh, our biggest problem was drop coal to ale and we've done below drainage. So, but that doesn't, I, I don't see how Horsefly Lake would really give us direct benefit. Right. Or am I missing something? So during the spring event when, um, when Chin and Stafford were at capacity, um, they weren't able to receive any more water. So we were given uh, notification that we weren't allowed to pump any more water into uh, the SMRD canals during that, that event. So, what it does is it allows them to relieve water downstream so that we can increase our flow rates upstream. So then how does that affect the people like downstream from that, like in Medicine Manhattan? Like what well, sort of impact does that have if we increase the river flow, if there's that big a flood? I guess. Without the spillway, that water all ends up in Medicine Hat. But it all ends up there going through Medicine Hat and the river, Correct. so Saskatchewan River, so what there's impacts one way or another, I guess. Yeah, because this spillway goes to the Old Man River. Right, but it turns into the South Saskatchewan anyway. Well, so. I, I do not have a firm handle on that. I've looked at our portion, and all that, uh, uh, that I, the part that I understand is that we would be able to increase our flow rates out of Lethbridge County. And how it's dealt with, as far as a, Part of that spillway is uh, up to SMRD operations and how they operate the spillway when it's. Uh, from what I understand, in the spring they were very close to a breach at that uh, uh, whatever that reservoir is called. A horse line. No, 40 miles. Yeah. Well, horse line was running over the roads. So that's where they had all the pumping problems. Yeah. But downstream of there, uh, upstream. Anyway, I'd have to look into that for the, the details on the actual. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I, um, I did not know uh, a whole bunch about this, but uh, I did attend that meeting uh, with the drainage uh, group in Tabor in uh, this summer in July. And as Rick uh, alluded to, there was a, a list put forward of different projects and, and their potential impact. And it was the feeling of the group at the time that this project essentially would give the, the best bang for the buck, other options being um, expanding reservoir capacity at Chin, um, doing things further down the line at Sodder and other places. Um, but the way that it was presented to the group, um, this made the most sense financially to just try to alleviate that stress and essentially that create a valve there where they can let pressure off the system. And as Rick said it, then create capacity for us on this side will also um, further east uh, alleviate some of that pressure coming into those reservoirs down there. As far as uh, your concerns, um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to say at this time what the impacts of returning that water to the river would be. Um, but I do believe that it was taken into consideration. And like I said, it was just um, in that meeting at the time, the group felt that um, this is something that we needed to move on um, as far as funding went. And as Rick has also said, there was no commitment of finance at the time, um, other than that this is something that we needed to get our arms around 
and once we the funding was in place and, and once we were able to um, secure some grant funding, then the group was willing to uh, negotiate amongst itself to try and find a solution to funding it. I think it's the horse fly reservoir, but it's the struct whatever the dam structure is called. I forget what it's called. I can't find it here. <clears throat> Um, just a question too, and what they're requesting is a letter of support to apply for phase two, is that correct? Um, no, it's a resolution to become a partner in the community partnership funding. Okay. Um, so if it's $78,000, ACP is typically 50 <coughs> so you're looking at 30, 39000 split 14 ways is $3,000. If we if we're um, successful, now those 14 partners each have to um, come to the table with a resolution, and if they don't, then the remaining partners may be on the hook for the rest of it. But $78,000, even if it's down to 10 partners, not 14, is still uh, only $3,500, $4,000. So we wouldn't know how many other partners were contributing until we got a um, sense of how many others had forwarded resolution. And my understanding was, Rick, that it had to be in by February 1st. Yeah, the ACP funding application. That was part of the meeting. We didn't realize that this portion of the, of the project would be fundable until we were at that meeting and Michaela from uh, the province uh, said, hey, this, uh, this is community partnership. You guys are eligible to, to apply for preliminary engineering. And, and I know it's Morris has a question, but one more question, just how many other of the 14 partners are, was there indication at that meeting that the majority of the 14 partners would be putting forward a resolution? There was, at the meeting, there was enough of the committee representation there that they felt there was a quorum and they voted that they would uh, proceed with spending the seventy-eight thousand dollars with or without the funding. Thank you, Mars. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I haven't got much to add anymore after uh, all of that. But uh, to me, it looks like you know um, we got to we should be spending that seventy-eight thousand dollars to get things maybe in the open. Like it's not necessary that it is, that whole project is going to be uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, doable, whatever you know. But you got to have the open houses to make that start. So that seventy-eight thousand dollars, you know, uh, that looks like to me, it's uh, almost a no-brainer. You should do that before you <coughs> really get into it because yeah, that's my comment. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just by the picture on the back, is, is it more of a reservoir and spillway off the canal system, not the, not the river? That's exactly what it is. Okay. Um, Just to be a little more clear on what I'm saying. Yeah, it's because the SMRID and TID take on a, a lot of overland uh, drainage water, and they can't, because their canals get smaller as you go downstream, they don't take all that capacity, so they need an area that they can spill that extra and, and regain their freeboard in the canal. Any other questions? Can't so, so basically, the, the, the St. Mary's, they only got the, the Saunders still way into the South Saskatchewan. And they want this to go into the old land. Again, I don't know the downstream engineering that well, but as far as I understand, that's correct. There are there are some municipalities that are downstream, um, like the city of Medicine Hat, that do have an issue with this project because they feel that they would better spend the money in their municipality doing uh, flood mitigation to protect their people versus alleviating the upstream pressure. Steve? 
And Medicine Hat is a partner of them too? They are a partner yeah. right now, and they were part of the group that, that was represented at that meeting. But going further, they may or may not remain a partner. We don't know. Any other questions? If not, we would need a resolution then to move forward. I'll move that there. Should we, uh, should we go forward with the, the application of that 78,000 models? I think that needs to be an application right before it, and then uh, jointly funded by the uh, interest of parties. because it is famous, I believe. So just um, for formality reason, um, I'm a counselor for the MD of Bighorn. I am also the chair of the Bow Valley Regional Waste Commission, so we look after uh, Class Three landfill that services Banff, Tamar, uh, and the MD of Bighorn. Uh, I also um, sit on the Calgary Region Airshed Zone, so we do all the air quality management uh, in the Calgary Region. And most of everything I do in my portfolio as a council has to do with waste management and environment, so I'm not new to this body. Uh, and for the record, I have absolutely no association with any waste management companies, private financial institutes, or technology makers. So I, I come to this the same as you guys come to it as an elected official. And so I'm going to go through my presentation here. I hope not to bore some of you that have seen it before. Uh, there are some new things in here, and then when I get to the end of it, I, you guys are going to have some questions for me, uh, and I'm going to ask you to go on camera so that I can answer them for you very candidly rather than give you a political response. So with that, I'll hopefully I can run this thing. And I can... Lorraine... How do I advance this thing? Larry, page, page down, over here, page down? Yeah. Okay. Let's try that. Page down right there? Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Or maybe I page up. Or page up. <laughs> All right. So, so we started off uh, research and implementation. Uh, and the uh, reason non recyclable waste materials are in caps there and bold is because we're not after the stuff that we can recycle. Uh, you know, it was very exciting to hear um, an announcement the other day that $750,000 is now going into you know, a pilot project uh, for ag plastics. Uh, which I think is really, really good. It is not contrary to what CEWA is doing, it's actually complementary, uh, because we believe that wherever we can find efficiencies in recycling, you don't need energy from waste. Energy from waste is very much an end of life solution to recyclables, and so they had the G7 in, uh, on the east coast in uh, Nova Scotia a few months ago, and one of the outcomes of that was that they actually did make the statement that energy from waste is a viable solution for end of life uh, recyclables. So you can recycle plastic, uh, you know, five, six times, it leaves, it comes back as a Tupperware container, it goes away, it comes back as a lawn chair, it goes away, it comes back as a hairbrush, it goes away, it comes back as a garbage bag. Well, when it becomes a garbage bag, it doesn't go away and come back again. So what we're looking at is the ability to take end of life uh, materials and use energy from waste to get those last few calories out of it, uh, generate some electricity, light some light bulbs, uh, and really power uh, a recycling facility that would be adjacent to it. And it's the same thing with cardboard. So I, I said I had a pizza from uh, Two Guys Pizza last night, and I really did. Yeah. 
And a lot of people don't know that that pizza box can't be recycled. Because if you have food waste on cardboard, it doesn't go in the recycling stream, it goes into the other stream. So if you can think of left and right on the fork in the road, uh, really nice clean cardboard uh, can be recycled into something else. But if it has food waste on it, it can't. So it ends up going in another direction. And so what we're proposing is that direction be the energy from waste direction. So here's our footprint uh, when we incorporated in 2012. And people will say, well, Jesus, that's six years ago. Ryan, why has this taken so long? Uh, I think that um, my mentor, who was uh, Roger Anderson, who was the, would have been my equivalent with the Durham York project in Ontario for an energy from waste facility, is that we see changes in government uh, at the municipal level. And I want you to think of that footprint there and just look at around the room and see how many councils you have for one municipality. Now I want you to multiply that by close to 50. And then you have one year after you have changes in council, you have changes in administrators. Uh, and then you kick it up a little bit to go to the provincial level, and then you have a provincial election and you have a change in direction. And then you kick it up a little bit more and go to the federal elections. And so we're constantly in the education mode. Uh, I actually go to sleep sometimes, I close my eyes and I see that map. Uh, because we're always trying to make sure that people understand what we're doing. Uh, because there are some ideologies out there that don't like us, there's some uh, heavy lobby groups out there that don't like what we're doing. Uh, and then we're municipalities, and we, as municipalities, we like to do the right thing, but a lot of times our ratepayers want us to vote with our checkbook. Uh, so we make those types of decisions. So that's what it was back in 2002. This is what it was when we last did the map. And we have members coming and going and coming and going. Uh, we have some that have been members, they've left, they've come back, they've left again. And some that have been members left, came back, left and came back again. Uh, and then we have uh, other municipalities that are on the periphery, so you can see the top of that map, so you go north, that map has actually changed, it's gone uh, even further north again. This cost us a lot of money actually to get an IT person to do this map for us, so we just stopped doing the map and said, okay, take a snapshot and do your engineering from there, because if we kept updating our engineering every time we had someone join SEWA or someone leave SEWA, We'd spend all of our money on engineering and we would spend no money on getting things done. So that's kind of like what it is right now. Here's where I'm from. Uh, so, uh, Bow Valley Region Waste Commission. So, Town of Banff, uh, Banff National Park. I want you to think about the flagship of the Canadian Park System, greener than green. Uh, there are trucks from Banff, 800 kilometer round trip with their waste. Their waste travels almost as much as their tourists do. Uh, so, this is the reality of voting with your checkbook. Uh, certainly that waste could go a shorter distance, but in reality they go up to Camrose, the dry meat landfill, where the tipping fees are very, very low. Uh, your waste here in Lethbridge goes to, or sorry, county goes into the city of Lethbridge's landfill. I think your tipping fees now are somewhere north of 100 bucks a ton. Uh, and up in Camrose at the dry meat landfill, it's around 35 bucks a ton. And trucking is not that expensive. We always think it is. Like when we think about gravel, and you guys are coming, so we think about gravel. Uh, we know that uh, gravel is cheap and trucking is incredibly expensive. Uh, but trucking waste works up to about 20 cents a ton kilometer. So there's a lot of commercial uh, waste managers that rather than going to the closest landfill, go to one that's much further away, but it's really the economics of it. As much as we would like to do the right thing environmentally, at the end of the day, if you look at it, it comes down to economics. So how do we get started? You guys are charter members of the Sewa organization. You were one of the Founders of it, you were a part of SEWA before I was a part of SEWA. And uh, the city of Lethbridge was a part of it, and the city of Lethbridge left SEWA shortly after the county made a deal with the city to allow an expansion of the city's landfill. I won't go into why that occurred, but uh, we do know that that did occur. Uh, we started off with some uh, money for rural Alberta economic development because energy from waste is an economic engine. They make incredibly good anchors for heavy industrial parks. Uh, especially when you think about district energy or district uh, electricity, so steam that's generated. But more importantly, if you've got to bring in a transmission line like they do right now for the town of Bowles for their uh, canvas operations, they need 100 megawatts of power. And to bring in a new transmission line to provide that, I want you to think about how many agreements you would need to go across private property to bring in heavy transmission lines and the actual cost of doing that, whereas energy from waste to provide district electricity. Uh, our membership grew very quickly because it didn't cost anything. Uh, everybody has garbage, so everybody said, let's go see if that's a solution. 
and uh, we've seen people come and go curiosity we've also seen them uh, come and stay uh, because they actually look a little further down the road and go well our landfill will wear out someday uh, and what's that going to cost us and is this a possible solution this is a motherhood statement uh, and the reason we put it there is that the uh, the lobby groups uh, that are opposed to energy from waste, the, the first thing out of their mouth is that it's going to take away from our recycling, uh, which is contrary to uh, factual information. Uh, in the United States, uh, Solid Waste Association of North America, and you guys are a part of that, uh, they did a study and it actually stated that we're in the states of the United States that have energy from waste recycling actually went up and did not go down. And so people go, well, how? It's counterintuitive. That doesn't make sense. Right? When you think about it, all the metals that go into an energy from waste facility come back out again. Uh, they come out uh, through uh, different processes, ferrous and non-ferrous metals, and also the community becomes a little bit more attuned to what's happening, and recycling does go up. Uh, of course, the people that are opposed to energy from waste, well, that's just a snapshot in time, uh, and the report was slanted, but it's a peer-reviewed report, uh, a lot of engineering letters behind it. And then they went back two years ago and we visited that question and they found that recycling continues to increase. So anybody that tells you that if you have energy from waste recycling goes down, uh, that statement from them would be factually inaccurate. So we thought it was a good idea. Uh, we wanted to find out uh, if it actually was a good idea. So we went to the Edmonton Center of Waste Management, which is considered to be uh, one of the good thought groups uh, in Alberta. Uh, for innovation. They helped us do the terms of reference through a feasibility study and through a competitive process we hired a company called HDR. Uh, since then HDR actually was the engineers of record for the Durham uh, region energy from waste project which is the newest one in Canada. Uh, so our engineers actually were coming to us not with um, concepts but actually information that was based on facts uh, information based on emissions that were known, operating costs that were known, life cycles that were known. Uh, so we actually really did hire the best experts that we could find. So then we did the feasibility study. So uh, seven components of that. Uh, it was a stepwise process. So when we started doing it, we did task one first. And if task one gave us good information, then we went to task two. And if task two gave us good information, we went up the ladder. We didn't go out and spend three hundred fifty thousand dollars to do a piece of engineering, then decide that it wasn't a good idea. We said, let's spend a little bit of money on task one. If it leads us to uh, a good question, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. So I've given Lorraine. A, it's actually in front of me. Lorraine is going to have it when I leave. Is a flash drive, and on this flash drive, it represents uh, one and a half million dollars worth of engineering reports. But really, it represents about three and a half million dollars worth of investment from Sewa. So. Um, County of Lethbridge pays a membership fee. I believe you guys have 13,000 people or so uh, in your census. Uh, and, and 10-5. 10-5? Yeah. Sorry. Where did I get 13,000? Uh, 13, oh, I'm, I know where I got it. I have too many numbers rolling around my head. So your increase when we up the um, request for uh, funding, your increase would be 1,300 bucks. I believe. That's where I got 13. Um, so we've got about three and a half million dollars invested in this right now. Um, one and a half million dollars worth of engineering on the flash drive. And that represents a significant investment, but more importantly, it also represents the business plan for private sector. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to tell you today, I'm going to ask you to go on camera later so I can answer those questions candidly for you, uh, is stuff that when little snippets of it were released to private sector uh, through uh, public presentations, we saw private sector go around to the municipalities and then try to use that information uh, as leverage for them to get more business. And in camera, I can tell you who that was, but I can't tell the public. So we did all this stuff in the feasibility study, and then it said, well, you know, it's a good idea. And then we said, okay, well, then how do we prove that out? So then we went and did this, and that's a lot of engineering. And people say, why does this take so long? Well, it takes so long because we rely on uh, provincial grant funding, some federal grant funding, uh, and then you have to do these engineering studies over a period of time. Like the waste stream characterization takes over a year to do because you've got to do it through different seasons and cycles and it identifies the waste stream that you have. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Uh, 
Uh, and then finally, uh, the last couple down there, the SEI analysis with the University of Alberta, uh, was a very interesting piece of work. And then the LCA is, is a life cycle analysis. So that's a cradle to grave analysis of your carbon footprint for your operation. Uh, what it costs to build it, what it costs to operate it, what is your carbon footprint, and over the life of the project. And those last two pieces were done as a result of the last provincial election. There was an informal meeting uh, with the Minister of Environment uh, where she stated that she did not believe our environmental assertions as to our ability to reduce greenhouse gases. So if the Minister of Environment doesn't believe you, you're not going anywhere. So uh, those last two bullets there cost $350,000 to do. $175,000 came out of the piggy bank for Sewa, and that was all the cash that we had in reserve uh, to go and prove that our engineers were right. And we did, and I'm going to show that information on that. Uh, now, unfortunately, since we've done all that work, we haven't been able to get a formal meeting with the Minister of Environment. Uh, however, uh, the information is out there, it is peer-reviewed, uh, the federal government gave us $175,000 to do part of this work. And to uh, put that into context, the Chief of Staff for the Federal Minister of Environment is an ex-executive director of the Cameron Institute. The senior environmental advisor to the Premier of Alberta is in a picture with the Minister or with the Premier announcing their climate leadership plan, and he is an executive director of the Cameron Institute. So it kind of made sense for SEWA to hire the Cameron Institute to go and do a life cycle analysis and do a peer review of this because that is what the different orders of government and that's who they believe as advisors and certainly they would be the best ones to take a critical eye to the engineering work that SEWA had done. So that's what we did. That only took a year and a half to do all of that environmental work. So when we did our initial feasibility study and our work, you can see that circle and it's kind of uh, around um, Walton County. And so if you think about the center of Mass Hall, uh, you can think of a dartboard uh, where the bullseye is in the center. And then you add some weighting to it that says, well, I've got a little bit of waste to the left and I've got a little bit of waste to the right or north and south. And so as members come and go, that circle moves up and down or left and right. Uh, if the city of Medicine Hat was to join the state organization, that circle would move a little bit to the right and a little bit to the bottom. And if, let's say, uh, if Airdrie or Red Deer, city of Red Deer, they were to join, then the circle would move north. So it's based on an efficiency of transportation more than anything else. Uh, where is the best place to put it? So if you guys are in the county, if you were to put a salt shed uh, someplace in the county, you would probably think, well, we need to put it closest to the center so that our transportation costs are lower instead of putting it in one corner or another corner. So that's what we did in the original uh, feasibility work. And then when we did the life cycle analysis, we hired the University of Alberta, and they went and they critiqued what we did. We also gave them data, <coughs> excuse me, gave them data that we didn't have back then. And this is what they came up with. And uh, I can't think of a graph that would be more confusing than that one. Uh, but actually what it did was it took uh, a scientific approach to where the best place to put it would be. And they also used a, an environmental lens on it, uh, where they considered the carbon footprint of trucking. So we think of trucking as municipalities and what does it cost us to do it. Uh, and with this, they used cost, but they also used carbon footprint. Uh, and that actually proved out that what we came up with originally would <coughs> burn off. And we've had members come and go, but our waste uh, the volume of waste that we have hasn't really changed that much. Uh, and what it proved to us is that if you have people coming and going, you're probably going to be in the right spot if you use your original stuff. And that star uh, is not far away from that, where that original circle was. It's a little bit closer to the Trans-Canada Highway. But what it really is, is it's close to transmission lines, uh, sorry, transmission lines, railways, and major highways that are maintained by the province. So that is based on efficiency, uh, not just cost efficiency of trucking, but also environmental efficiency. And then we did a waste stream characterization. So I want you to picture a bunch of engineers, and some of you guys are going to love this, dumping, jumping into dumpsters and hauling out garbage. And so basically what we did was we uh, got samples of waste produced by our members, uh, dropped on the floor, and then they pulled out, I believe it was 40 different types of waste 
and then waited to come up with an average characterization of what's in the waste stream. We're not far off the national average, but because we're mostly rural, we have different types of waste. So in the cities, uh, you know, people live in apartment buildings, they have little garbage bags full of waste. But you know, if you get out in rural Alberta where we actually do work, uh, we have a different type of waste. And what you'll see in there is a bunch of stuff called residuals. Um, and that's the stuff that we're after at the Energy from Waste Project. We're not after the paper that can be recycled or the plastic that can be recycled because we believe we can do better at recycling. What we're after is the stuff that is too contaminated to be recycled, that end of life stuff that's destined to the landfill. Uh, when we also did this, we also looked at how much waste is generated by each of our members. So we know what the tonnage is. We know where you collect it. We know where all the transfer sites are. Uh, and we know what we can use and we know what we can't use. So that piece of work there took a year to do and that cost us, I think, about 300,000 bucks. So none of these pieces of engineering are cheap, uh, but in order to justify your business case, you have to use qualified engineers and you have to use qualified professionals and, and that's exactly what we did. So this is what we came up with in our original work. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm comparing what we did with our original work and then I'm comparing it to what the peer review said, what the uh, people with the critical lens came up with. So what we looked at uh, was the different types of technologies that were out there. We started off, I think we had about 20 technologies that we looked at, uh, and then we made a rule that said that the only thing we're going to spend any money uh, working on is stuff that is commercially demonstrated. In other words, a good idea on a workbench in a garage is a good idea on a workbench in a garage, but has it been commercially demonstrated? Can you give us actual data that says it can do this? So you guys can there are different technologies out there right now, and especially in this day and age that are experimental, that are receiving a tremendous amount of funding. Um, and what SEWA said is that, no, we're, we want tried and proven and stuff that can be justified, and more importantly, we can look at the numbers and see if they actually work. And so what we landed on uh, was refuse derived fuel, or RDF. And uh, that would be very similar to what you would see with Lafarge up my way that wants to go and use waste as a substitute for coal or natural gas as a fuel. That technology is very well known. The next one is mass burn combustion. Uh, that technology is the most used technology in the world. Uh, very much what you see over in Europe uh, where they uh, have incredible recycling rates and uh, they also have energy from waste as an end of life and they use that uh, to generate electricity and heat for a lot of their subdivisions. Uh, the next one's gasification. So you take waste and you, uh, a number of different technologies, and you turn it into a gas, and then you take that gas and then you burn it uh, to generate it. And then plasma arc gasification, which is a really good one. Uh, pyrolysis is a, one of those technologies. That one fell off the list, uh, and it was on there then, but what happened was the, the Plasco operation that you guys may know that name, was in Ottawa, so that was an energy from waste facility, that was plasma arc, that every time they had a political convention, they would turn the thing on, everybody would go through there and go, ooh, ah, what a wonderful thing it is. Now they went bankrupt and they took tens and hundreds of millions of dollars with them when they went from municipalities in, so uh, we don't consider that to be a good one. And then the last one is landfill, so landfill was the base that they compared it to. And so what you see at the very bottom uh, is the reduction in greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, compared to landfilling. And so everybody goes, well, how do you get more than 100% reduction? Well, uh, you also consider that we generate electricity from coal or natural gas, and so that was also factored into that. Uh, our engineers can explain that much better than I can, uh, but basically what it told us is that mass burn combustion had the most bang for your buck. Uh, financially, economically, as well as reduction in greenhouse gas, because with refuse-derived fuel, there's a lot of pre-processing where you've got to separate out the waste and get down to the stuff that will actually work, and then you have to process it into a fuel product that can be injected. Mass burn combustion is the one that Sewa rested on, and one of the main reasons for that is that it serves our rural municipalities the most. Uh, while the urbans have a big problem with waste, the rurals have a big problem with waste, but we have a totally different waste stream. So you guys may be aware that uh, the uh, Pincher Creek Regional is it Pension Creek Regional Waste Commission? I believe it is. They applied for a permit for a livestock incinerator um, so that they could deal with the downers uh, as well as the uh, highway road kills.
because we're taking up way too much space, and so they wanted to put an incinerator in there. They spent two years in the permitting process. They were turned down. The Alberta environment uh, refused their application for one, uh, and then Pincher Creek turned around and said to Alberta environment, well, if you won't give us a permit, then we're not taking your livestock. So we now have a problem that we didn't have a little while ago, and one of SAWA's commitments to its members is that we would provide the technology that our agricultural industry could use. And so mass burn, uh, you can consider that, you can throw them in hoops and all, uh, instead of having to pre-process it. So that is the technology that we rested on, and then our engineering went from there to evaluate that. So when we did our life cycle analysis, um, our engineers of record, HDR, they provided all the data inputs because we'd already spent a million bucks on engineering and they had all the information, so it made sense that they would provide the data. They provided the data to the Pemina Institute and to a company called uh, ONG Sustainability. And then they reviewed the data and they took a very critical eye to it. And so if I went back to this number here, it would say under mass burn combustion that we would uh, have a reduction of 116,000 tons a year of greenhouse gas reductions. Now that's not chump change. If you think the um, green line LRT for the city of Calgary that um, both levels, higher orders of government, are tripping over themselves to throw money at, would reduce greenhouse gases by about 40,000 tons a year. We predicted that it would be 116,000 tons a year. When we went to our life cycle analysis with a critical eye, we actually ended up with 376,000 tons a year of greenhouse gas reductions, almost double. And that's peer reviewed. That is uh, in a paper that was written by the Pemmon Institute. Now, it hasn't been made public yet because the federal government hasn't signed off on it. But that equates to 7 million tons of greenhouse gas reductions over the life of the project. That is a significant number. I'm not going to talk about whether or not you can sell those GHG credits at $15 a ton or $30 a ton. But in today's market, at $30 bucks a ton, that's $210 million bucks over the life of the project. And then it starts to make sense why private sector is banging on our door. And greenhouse gas credits are transferable. You may be able to generate the greenhouse gas credits here, but you can apply them to an operation you have in another place, kind of like cap and trade. So when the minister didn't believe our numbers, we were at three and a half million tons over the life of the project, around 16,000 tons, and then when we hired um, their most respected environmental advisors, they actually came up and said, no, uh, your numbers are off, the minister was right, your numbers are wrong. It actually doubled, so now it's seven million tons, or 370,000 tons a year. And if the feds are throwing billions of dollars at the Green Line LRT in the city of Calgary for 40,000 tons a year, what do you think they would throw at a SAWA project with 370,000 tons a year? And if any of you had that answer, I'd love to know it. So then we went out and said, okay, so we think it's a good idea, who wants to play ball? So we went out to the marketplace, uh, talked to uh, technology vendors, and we also talked to municipalities and said, who would like to have this in their neighborhood? And I want you to think of um, the problems they had in Burnaby, BC trying to expand their heat waste facility and it ended up going to court. They need a judge to decide where it goes. In the case of SAWA, we have a whole bunch of members that actually want to have this in the municipality because they make good anchors for industrial parks. It is high tech jobs, uh, it generates electricity. And we also had a whole bunch of technology vendors that said, absolutely, we've looked at your engineering, you guys have everything that we need to be able to do this, so we would like to play ball as well. And this is the playing field. So here's the complexities of it. We are the largest municipal cooperative in Alberta. We believe that. However, in southern Alberta, you guys have, and Lauren, you corrected me on this once before, you have a South Grove. Is it South Grove? Yes. I think you got more municipalities than we got. I'm not saying I'm jealous. I, I, just, I, I don't know those numbers. I think your, it's more than your flight yard changes a bit, so. Oh, you guys got a revolving door, too? Yeah. So, but it is a pretty, I mean, when you look at our footprint, you look at all the municipalities, you know, picture how many councillors you've got, CAOs you've got, and all these people working together. You know, it took a, an act of, the, it took a municipal government act to make seven municipalities work together for the Calgary region. And we've got all these municipalities working together, uh, doing one thing, and it always, people go, how do you manage to do that? And one of the reasons I say I think it's successful is that when 
the county of Lethbridge says, Ryan, come down, we want to talk to you. I jump in my truck and I run down to talk to you so that you guys are, can get your answer to your questions. Uh, mostly small urbans and rurals. Uh, so City of Calgary, City of Lethbridge, Medicine Hat are not a part of this. And large urbans generally don't want to join anything that they can't control. Uh, and because this is a grassroots urban, mostly urban and small rural, uh, big municipalities don't control this. Um, our members come and go. If we had a revolving door, I wouldn't say that we could cool the building with it, but I can tell you that they come and go. Uh, but it stayed mostly the same. Our industrial waste is not like what they have in the cities. It's totally different. When we did our engineering work, we actually started peeling off a lot of the stuff, the, the low-hanging fruit that people think is available to them. Um, the ag waste, we didn't really factor uh, all of the ag waste into it because we know that it's a hard uh, commodity to grab. What we factored into is the waste that we control as municipalities, like the municipal solid waste. Um, you know, I think there's been like six initiatives now to try to capture railroad ties as a feedstock for an energy from waste facility. Uh, but you guys are rural, so you've got a lot of grain farmers out there that will tell you how easy it is to make a deal with the railway. Imagine trying to make a deal with the railway for a 20 year business plan. Uh, and what used to be uh, a cost of the railway to get rid of railroad ties uh, and all of these now uh, ventures that are going out there talking to the railway and saying, well, we'd like to use your railroad ties as a feedstock for our energy waste facility. All of a sudden, it went from being a nuisance in the waste product of the railways to being a commodity. And it went from how much would they pay for you to take it to how much will you pay us to give it to you. And so uh, we drop railroad ties right off of uh, any possible feedstock that we have. Um, the other thing that works really good is steam. So you guys are probably the largest uh, confined feeding operation in this in the province of Alberta. So you got all these CFOs, you go down the road, we've got all these meat processors down there. And what the meat processors use the most of is water, especially hot water. Uh, and then you've got uh, beets and potatoes and things like that. They use all of these things. So an energy from waste facility can provide a great deal of processed steam. A processed steam can go about 15 kilometers and keep its processed steam value. I didn't know that. And that, that amazed me until someone said to me, well, how do you think they eat New York? So that steam transfer technology has been around for a couple hundred, 150 years, very well known. Uh, when I was in China looking at recycling facilities, actually the government rented the water to the recycling facilities and so they would use the hot water to recycle plastic because that's one of the things that you have to have to do it. Because plastic melts with water, it doesn't melt with uh, a, a fire, it uses steam. And they rent the water to the processing facilities and then when they're done with it, they ship it back. Uh, the municipality cleans the water and sends it back to them again. Uh, so it, it has a great value for district heat or for um, water use, as well as uh, electricity for other things. So the recycle, the energy waste facility in West Palm Beach, Florida is the newest one I think in the United States. I went down and had a look at that one. And so they've got a giant energy waste facility, one million tons a year of waste goes through that thing. And they have a materials recycling facility right next to it. And what they do is they send the uh, recyclables into the recycling facility, the MRF, where the high value recyclables are peeled off very quickly. And then the stuff that can't be recycled, which is generally about 30% of what you see <coughs> in there. So we think we can recycle it, we throw it in the bin, but about 30% of it can't be recycled. So instead of that having to be shipped to a landfill, it goes around the corner into the energy from waste facility. That produces the electricity that runs the materials recycling facility. So when you, you think about, people talk about this circular economy, or you want to look at a recycling graph that shows you these arrows going in a, in a circle. You can see the recyclables going in, the good high value stuff goes off to the right, and the stuff that can't be recycled goes off to the left and goes to the energy from waste facility. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the one commitment that we had for our municipalities, and I was down in Coots uh, during the BSE thing. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of manning the summer follow field as a parking lot, so that was a great day. Uh, but it was worth it to see the helicopter with the RCMP in the black pajamas and the doors open, flying over the top of us when we were trying to give away hamburgers. And at that time, we had Ralph's uh, solution to BSE and everything else, which was shoot, shovel, and shut up. And we haven't changed that. We still don't do anything different. And so one of the commitments that we had was to make sure that our technology would be something that if we did have a, an outbreak of BSE or avian flu or hoop and mouth or any of those things, 
that we would be able to uh, take those uh, the, that commodity in and dispose of it uh, in a way that looked after our economy. So when British Columbia had the avian flu outbreak, it had a major impact on their tourism because the tourists that were coming in from Asia couldn't come in anymore because they were afraid they were going to bring avian flu back to Asia. So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, conscripted the Energy and the Waste Facility in Burnaby <clears throat> to deal with the avian flu. Now I want you to picture end dumps traveling through Lotus Land, through downtown Vancouver, full of live chickens headed off the Energy and the Waste Facility. So we're proposing something a little bit different than that. We'd like to actually be close to the railroad tracks. So if we do have something like that, that we would be able to service not just our members in rural Alberta, but all of Alberta to provide a solution, uh, a viable solution to deal with those types of things. And while we don't think in the cities, we don't think about it, but in rural Alberta, we do think about it because our economy is heavily based on our ability uh, to have that type of an industry. So it was very important to us to make sure that uh, we could do something to address that should it ever occur again. And it's not just will it occur again, it's just when does it occur and how serious is it. So the ability to nip it in the bud, I think, would be a great thing for us to be able to do. Now it comes down to how do you pay for it. My, my wife's favorite saying is, it's a great idea, Ryan, that's your budget. Um, so how do you pay for it? So I, I talked a little bit earlier about the greenhouse gas reductions and things like that and the green line in Calgary. And you can see different orders of government throwing money into it or at it. Uh, so to save, you know, 40,000 tons a year, the feds are throwing billions of dollars at the Green Line. The provincial government is throwing billions of dollars at it as well. So if you had an energy and waste facility, would it be a regional utility? Would it be just like water and wastewater? Would it be like regional transportation? Why wouldn't it be like that? If you look at how much money the feds spend uh, on wastewater management in Ontario or Quebec, and how much they spend on it in Vancouver. So why wouldn't an energy and waste facility be considered very much like a regional utility? We want to do a utility model because that way municipalities control it. Uh, we own it just like our regional waste commission. So uh, we through, by default, we have control of it. We have control over the rates. Uh, we don't need a profit margin as private sector does. Uh, we wouldn't operate it. Uh, we would hire someone as professional to operate it. Uh, you would see a board of directors that's a skilled-based board rather than a politically appointed board. Uh, kind of like some electrical utilities that we have uh, in the city of Calgary or the city of Edmonton. And then, of course, there's private sector. So uh, before we had the last provincial election, or during the last provincial election, P3 Canada uh, approached Sewa and wanted to invest in it. They bring in uh, up to $100 million, and we've been back and forth Ottawa with them. They reviewed all of our engineering, we fitted the portfolio, and we were ready to go with a procurement proposal to P3 Canada, uh, and things were working well, and then we had a provincial election, and then we had a federal election, and the last comment from P3 Canada was, Ryan, sorry about your luck, and P3 Canada was dissolved shortly after that by the federal government. So we were at very close to procurement stage before the last round of provincial and federal elections. And, and very much like what happened in Durham, New York, the clock rolled back and we had to start again with education, uh, going up to the ministries and trying to convince the different levels of uh, government about what we were doing and the value of it. And then of course we had to go and see, well, what is it gonna cost? It's a great idea, what's your budget? How much is it gonna cost me? So. This is the, uh, these are the numbers that came out of our engineering uh, economists. Uh, this information has also been peer reviewed. So this would be if we just went out on the street, private sector, and borrowed the money. And we borrowed, we were borrowing the money at 3.2% interest. And uh, the annual uh, debt servicing was about 50% of the total cost of the project. And I think we know that as municipalities that when we go out and borrow money over time, uh, we really do spend a lot of money on interest and other people make money off of it. But it was at 99 bucks a ton. So if you look at the tipping fees right now, um, I, the city of Lethbridge, I think is just north of 100 bucks. Uh, city of Calgary is north of 100 bucks. I'm the chair of the Bow Valley Waste Commission. We're at $115 a ton. Uh, those numbers aren't going down, they're going up. The rules keep changing. Alberta Environment makes retroactive rules for people that operate landfills. Uh, in the case of my waste commission, our landfill, we just had a $1.5 million bump in costs 
because Alberta Environment gave us a new rule. Uh, we will not see costs going down at landfills, we'll see them going up. So we compare that to landfilling and so the tipping fee, that includes uh, subsidy for operating costs and everything, was that 91 bucks a ton? Well that's if you go up and borrow the money. But what if you actually were treated like a regional utility, the way they treat water and wastewater? So if you're doing a regional water or wastewater project, it's up to 90% funding depending on how regional it really is. Uh, and that's different orders of government contribution. Uh, there's a lot of precedents that have been set for that. Uh, so I'm not talking out of hat here. Um, but this is what it would be if we didn't get any subsidies. Now 91 bucks a ton is still cheaper than what it cost me at the MDU Bighorn to ship waste or the town of Banff. I'm not sure what your costs actually are right now at the city of Lethbridge and we're in public so I don't want you to tell me that. Uh, but I know there are many varying rates uh, to it. But that's if we just went out and borrowed the cash. This is if we received an interest-free loan. Now, people go, how do you get an interest-free loan? Well, you just heard of an announcement, 400, I can't remember how much it was, uh, 400 something million dollars loan guarantee. Uh, and we also see interest-free loans from different orders of government, which means that we support it, but we want our money back. We're not gonna just give it to you as if you're doing a water or wastewater treatment plant or a regional trans transportation, but we will give you an interest-free loan because that way you can get your project going because there's a benefit to it. So that's at 57 bucks a ton. But what if they treated it like a green line LRT where they say, hey, this is a really good regional utility and it's gonna have a major environmental benefit. And did I say 7 million tons of greenhouse gas reductions? So what if they gave us that type of money? It would be $4.79 a ton for tipping fees. So even in my best dreams, we're never getting there. It ain't gonna be that. I'm not naive enough to try to convince you to believe it. You're not naive enough to believe it. It'll never get that type of funding. But it will get funding. So where is the sweet spot? So the sweet spot, some are in around 50 bucks a ton. And the Burnaby Energy from Waste Facility, when it opened up, it said its tipping fee, and its tipping fee never changed for 20 years. Because you can predict the cost, you control the, co the cost. And as all your other costs continue to go up for landfilling and environmental concerns, your tipping fees still stay the same. And the other thing that you don't have to do is look after the landfill after it closes. So when we did our closure, post-closure engineering work for the Waste Commission that I, that I chair, we ended up realizing that we had to put away $350,000 a year just into a reserve account to look after the landfill after it closes. When it stops generating revenue, it's no longer an engine of uh, cash it's now a major municipal liability. And you have to look after those things for 30 to 50 years going out because they continue to off-gas, they leachate into the ground, into the groundwater. There are, there are landfills in Alberta that are under cleanup orders, excavation orders. Some of them you may be aware of have been fined because of leachate running into water systems and getting into people's water wells. So as an energy and waste facility, you don't have to do that. So when it's over, you actually recycle the facility. You take it down and you recycle the steel. So we're not getting to four dollars and seventy-nine cents, but we're probably going to be somewhere in around fifty or sixty dollars a ton. We don't know that because the numbers will change as time goes on. Um, if we can get some sort of support from the problem and the feds, and this is what they look like. So people think you know you're you're looking at this giant stack that's belching out smoke. These pictures that you see on social media from the uh, professional environmental groups, uh, but this is an actual operating uh, energy from waste facility. There's a new one that's just being built, and I keep forgetting the name, I think it's in Hamburg, it actually has a ski hill on top of the energy from waste facility. So what they do is they hide them in plain view, uh, and you don't see them anymore. They're not this giant industrial belching smokestack. Um, and in Europe, they actually engineer them now into new developments so that if you're building this giant development, you will incorporate an energy from waste facility into it uh, that's close to the source, but also provides the heat for the uh, development and the electricity for it. That's just one of them. This is the one in, uh, oh, it's not Durham, uh, that's another one, so that's the more industrial looking one, and this is the latest one that's built in Canada, this is the one that's in Durham, New York. So uh, they do that because uh, when people can't find any other reason to object energy from waste, they will say it's ugly. And so they try to make them uh, look a little bit better. 
So what are we doing? Meeting for provincial government. Well, you know, um, I am disappointed to say that we're having a great deal of difficulty meeting with the Minister of Environment after we did all of that engineering work to prove our environmental claims. Uh, confirming our municipal commitment. I'm here today to talk to you guys. Uh, and we're doing a lot of these. And we're having a lot of municipalities that are not members of SEWA saying we want to meet with you. Uh, if you guys go look at Ols Cat TV, uh, I was up there for a one hour TV interview with those guys and I've been asked to go back again. Uh, this time was Rick MacGyver on his show. Uh, and there's a lot of municipalities that are saying, you know, if you guys can pull this off, we want to be a part of it. I got a lot of directors on Sewa saying, well, you know, you might want to be a part of it, but we're only going to build this thing a certain size. So you're either a part of the solution or you're watching the solution. But to wait for us to do all this work and at the very last minute say, oh, by the way, let me in on the bus too, uh, may not work out. Um, our AGM in 2018 uh, was a, we're stalled right now. Uh, we have some issues with getting the provincial government to come alongside. We are about to call an AGM here very, very shortly because we have a couple of solutions available to us that I'm going to talk to you about when we go on camera. And we're actually going to ask our membership what do we do? Do we stay on a utility path? Do we go with private sector funding because private sector is at our door? Uh, I have an MOU, uh, sorry, no, uh, non disclosure, non circumvention agreement that is on the agenda for say what this afternoon. Cost is going to be there when we talk about it. And we're going to look at private sector. So the different orders of government are not supporting us as a regional utility, which is the best model out there to control costs. Private sector is ready to take that three and a half million dollars that we have invested in this so far and put it to their own use and their own advantage. And it's not a matter of will there be an energy from waste facility in Alberta. It's a matter of who owns that energy from waste facility because private sector makes money off of these things and they do very, very well. Garbage is not going away, despite no, what everybody tells you, garbage is not going away. Uh, or do we switch to a large regional landfill? Because some of our members actually have land that is zoned and approved for a landfill. So that we take all of the engineering work that we have, the governance model, all our mapping, all our transportation work, and instead of applying that to an energy waste facility, do we apply it to a municipally owned regional landfill? And that's a very real possibility. And the question is, of course, who do we name it after? Because in Alberta we name landfills, and maybe we'll name it after someone who should be influenced. I don't know, but that's where we're headed, and Klaus is going to be a part of that decision. And that's that. So you guys, I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. If they are proprietary in nature, then I will ask that you wait until we go in camera to answer them. Good now, thank you. Any questions? There are, yeah, Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I've been a believer in this kind of since day one, but I guess the frustration is just has been, it, it always seems like it's just sort of stalled, but your presentation, and thank you for that, kind of shows you've done a lot of work and there's been government stalls and stuff like that. But I guess right now, yeah. can, the board's asking for a 33% increase in the membership fee. goes to our meetings, your municipality covers his costs of going there. His mileage, his meals, transportation, per diems, all those things. Very much like it is for me. We have a lot of municipalities, very much like um, the county, that have said, we want you to come to our council meeting, we've got some questions for you. So I've worn out a truck representing Sema, driving around. So um, last night my hotel room cost 115 bucks. And the two guys pizza was 22 bucks I think or something like that and so uh, in front of our uh, board at our meeting this afternoon is actually a budget for what it's costing us to go out to municipalities so member outreach or communications and what it works out to is about 600 bucks a trip and I believe 
that our admin has said that for 2019, we need a budget of about 12,000 bucks to go to the different municipalities. So uh, the increase to the county of Lethbridge uh, with that 33% would be 1,300 bucks a year. And for me to jump in my truck and drive down here to talk to you guys would cost about 600 bucks. That's where the money's going. It's, we're not, uh, we're very, we're very frugal. We're rural Albertans, right? I mean, we don't, we're not like big urbans where we throw money at everything. Uh, so I'm here this morning because I would be in picture view this afternoon. So instead of me driving down here and incurring uh, cost of money and things, we try to bundle these things up with where we have our board meetings because we invite members to come to our board meetings so that we don't have to go and speak to their councils individually. Uh, but literally, Steve, it's to, just to cover the cost of uh, servicing our members. And sometimes what we have, is, uh, especially with the, the political cycle, so we just had a municipal election a, a year and a bit ago, where you get new councillors. Well, in some councils, it's complete turnover, or 50% turnover. They don't know what we're doing. Uh, our website has a lot of information on it, but not uh, the type of information that you would want, like you just said, you want to see somebody in person so you can ask questions. Uh, so we have to go up and see those guys. Uh, we also have municipalities that are not members that say we'd like to talk to you. So it's who covers those costs. So what we're trying to do right now is find a way to um, have the municipality that say we want to see you to share some of those costs. Certainly we believe that say well can carry some of the costs. Um, but I think it's uh, it's not reasonable for the county of Lethbridge that pays membership in this to see that membership money going to the cost of us going to see someone that's not a member. But what do you do if they ask you to go and you don't go? Uh, if you don't go, there's one response, and if you do go, there's another response. They could be the same, but if you don't go, you definitely know the response you're gonna get. So basically that's where it's going. Uh, Klaus will have, uh, Klaus has seen our 2019 budget. Uh, it is not published on our site, but uh, certainly it's available in print form if you want it. And I think this afternoon we're looking at Eleven or twelve thousand dollar budget item for a member outreach. That's a long answer to the question. I'm using it to come and talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. Any any other questions? Sorry, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I think I would try to echo what uh, what Steve has just said. I I, I obviously have only been here for a short <coughs> period of time and. Uh, Seen your presentation twice now, and, and I think what you're bringing forward is great. I, I think you, I think you're passionate about it. You're well educated on it. And I think you, that's trickled down. I think Claus is, is very passionate about it as well. But I guess the, the question, I, and I think I know the answer. I think the answer is money. But what do we, where, what do you need? What do we have to do to get a shovel on the ground? Is it simply just them finding the money, or how do we get from A to B? I guess. So I'm, I'm going to give you a public answer, and then when we go in camera, I'm going to give you an in-camera answer. Um, energy from waste is a very politically charged solution to waste management. There are ideologies out there that believe that in the future there will be no waste. And there are ideologies out there that believe that everything can be recycled including those ideas. Uh, there are some uh, very well-funded lobby groups that are opposed to energy from waste. Because if you have energy from waste, you're not using landfills. Tony Soprano was in the garbage business for a good reason. So we are constantly um, dealing with well-funded, organized opposition. And then when you uh, bundle that up with changes in government, it slows the process down. So the Durham-York project was 10 years from concept to completion. And Roger Anderson uh, would have been my counterpart uh, for that project. Uh, and he mentored me in this, and one of the things that he taught me was don't be disappointed and don't take it personal because there are a lot of people out there who are very well funded to oppose you. And so it's a constant education thing. We were actually five years into the process when we had the last change in government. 
and the clock rollback. It cost us an extra $350,000 to address a concern from the new provincial government. And it took us a year and a half to do the engineering and do it. So it's, uh, why is it taking so long? You know, I, this morning when I was uh, shaving before I came down here, I said, they're gonna ask me that question, why is it taking so long? Because I ask myself that question every time I go to a meeting. And to be honest with you, the reason it takes so long is because it's changes in government and politics. Private sector is very, very ready to go and move forward on this, but that's not a solution that's best for our municipalities. What's best for our municipalities is a, a utility model. So then, you know, we're, we're on the eve of uh, going to have a provincial election, uh, going to have a federal election, so then is it not just, wouldn't it be fair for me to ask the question that do we not just risk that concern going forward? Then we're constantly in a political cycle one way or another. So how do we overcome that and, and I guess, skip over that hoop then? That's a really good question. You have the answer? Because I don't. Um, I, I think, Tori, uh, one of the things that um, I struggle with and our board struggles with is state law has never been political. We've gone through a bunch of municipal elections. We went through federal and provincial elections. We weren't political in the last provincial election or the last federal election. Because if you really want to put a stake in the heart of say, well, go political and roll the dice. Because you would have never predicted the outcome of the last provincial election. And if say, well, was to take a political bent on it, you would literally be rolling the dice with three and a half million dollars. And I don't think that we would be doing ourselves a favor if we were to be politicized, my fear, and it's my fear, so I'm allowed to have it, uh, is that uh, we may see some of our members uh, politicize say what? If I can just go, there we go, come back to that map. So if you were to look at that map and look at the footprint of it, what political persuasion would you think that map is? So. There are a lot of people that would love to politicize what we're doing. I mean, just imagine taking the concept that you have $7 million with the greenhouse gas reductions. And if your mantra at any level of government is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and SEWA has 7 million tons of it on a flash drive, why are you not over it? So we don't want to get politicized because it's too easy a target and it could really uh, fracture Sewa's organization. And I would hate to see our members getting uh, opposed to each other in politics because this election that's coming up, and, and I'm a political junkie, and I know Ann is too. Um, I'm, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it because I think it's probably gonna be the most entertaining on social media that we've had in a long time. But we're not gonna politicize it, uh, Tori, but when we go on camera, I will let be able to expand upon my explanation. Marsh. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I have hit with the Tory kind of, you know, alluded to that, you know, it's, it's pretty political, you know, but I cannot believe that our environment minister, we won't mention any names, but anyway, that she is not embracing this because, you know, this is a good environmental uh, solution to a lot of things. And, She's not impressing it. And that bothers me. That wasn't a question, was it, Morris? <laughs> no, I think it was a statement. Yeah, we're gonna put it up to the grave. We're gonna go in camera in a little bit. And we'll go ahead, Boston. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I just wanna commend you for, for coming here and do, doing this. But uh, you know, we uh, last week, uh, or this week actually, we had, uh, we had the, uh, Aircraft Service Board uh, Convention in uh, Calgary, and there was also the plastic thing came up there, and we've seen that well they can do all the recycling with the plastic, they're all, but it's all going to be the clean plastic. But there's more dirty plastic out there than there's clean plastic, and uh, so there's money for that, but not for the other one. And, and, and all those kind of things, that's where we come in. And I think you could probably answer a lot more questions more into detail, but then I think we have to go into camera, and then we can then we can uh, then we can start, start talking. Um, so, Pasha, there is a question embedded in your comment, though. Um, I actually, so, so um, I can't remember, someone phoned me the other day and said, did you see that announcement, $750,000 for that pilot project? It's a pilot project. 
a lot of cash. I mean, say a lot could use that money right now. Uh, but you know, actually what they're gonna do is something uh, that will support the Sewa initiative. Because we've known, there's been a number of initiatives for ag bags, right, uh, over time on what can do with this. So we know bear twine is a real nuisance because there's no equipment that actually uh, you can run it through. And then the big grain bags and things like that. Uh, and there's been a, a bunch of different plastic recyclers out there that have tried to process those ag bags. And it always comes down to one answer, is that it's too dirty. So is the cost of cleaning that plastic so you can melt it down and turn it into plastic crumb for injection molding and recycling. Is the cost of that going to be prohibitive? And we all know that when costs go up, uh, innovative solutions on the farm come to play. And uh, the Energy from Waste project, when we talk about going after the non-recyclable plastics, is we don't want the good grain bags that can be turned into a lawn chair or airbrush. We want the stuff that you can't recycle and instead of getting burnt in a field or thrown into a landfill, use it to generate energy. And so this pilot project, $750,000, is going to identify the percentage of those ag plastics out there that can't be recycled. We believe that we know the number, but it appears that somebody is going to spend $750,000 to confirm that. So we spent $350,000 confirming our environmental assertions. Someone's going to spend $750,000 confirming the amount of it that can't be recycled. So I look forward to the outcome of it. Any other questions? Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just one other thing, Paul. I know you kind of touched on a little bit. Um, a big thing that we're hearing is a diversion now, uh, going into the recycling stream. So it, it, a facility such as this, it needs a, a fuel source, and that fuel is the, the waste. If we're going to start seeing more and more diversion, does then your catchment area have to grow to then have more fuel, I guess, or I guess, could you comment on that at all, how, how that works? Does that impact the feasibility then? That's a really good question, Tor. Um, so we're going to get better at recycling. We really are. Um, and our population is going to grow at the same time. The amount of waste that an energy from waste facility needs to operate economy of scale. Uh, we have much more waste than that in our waste stream right now to do it. Um, the, uh, the last time I heard someone with multiple sets of letters behind their name talk about recycling and going to zero waste, because I think that's where, where you're thinking, right? We're going to go to zero waste. And there is no such thing as zero waste without energy from waste. Because no matter what we do, we are going to have materials that can't be recycled. And right now, uh, all of the engineering that I can find anywhere, because um, remember I had to learn about this too, so I did a lot of research before I threw my, I wanted my name out there as supporting energy from waste because I know I'm going to get personal attack. I get poison pen letters from the Sierra Club from time to time. Um, it's about 30% of the waste stream that's out there. We're never going to be able to recycle it. And so when the uh, people from uh, the experts in the field, when they tell you that you can have zero waste, but you need energy from waste to get there, they're basing that on what they know right now. So in the future, there's people are going to convince you, oh no, we're going to recycle everything. Uh, you know, there's people out there that believe by getting rid of plastic straws, you're going to solve the problem of plastics in the ocean. And um, on their planet, it probably works. But on this planet, it doesn't work. And if, and if you look at, so all these mixed plastics that are out there and extended producer responsibilities and, and this term diversion, which is a great term, um, how do you think that plastic ends up in the ocean? This is stuff that can't be recycled. And it's already there. And, and so they're gonna get it out of the ocean. What are they gonna do with it? They're gonna throw it in a landfill. So we send plastic, we send plastic to China. China was paying us $45 a ton for mixed plastic. We used to bail it up. You guys were doing it. Um, and we bail it up, we put it in bales, we put it in a sea can, and we send it to China for recycling. So we actually threw one of those tracker pods into a sea can, and then we followed it to China to see where it went. And that's how I ended up in China, looking at recycling. And so what we were shipping over there was everything that we could call plastic, recyclable plastic, we bailed it up, so you use the term diverted. That's where that term came from. 
And they said it's diverted from the landfill. What they really mean is it's diverted from your landfill, but not somebody else's. So China finally got sick and tired of it and said, you know guys, we're not paying you 45 bucks a ton for mixed plastic anymore. We want you to send us just good plastic. So I came back from China, I went and talked to the Alberta environment and said, hey guys, watch out. China's about to do this. And they told me what they were gonna do. And damn it, the Chinese, they've been sticking to their word for a long time, right? Hundreds of years. And they said that we're gonna stop taking your mixed plastic and we're gonna demand a higher quality plastic and we don't want you shipping your waste to us anymore. And they did. I can show you pictures on my phone, I can't do it in public, of bales and bales and bales of plastic and cardboard in landfills in Alberta that were diverted from the landfill through recycling streams that cost a lot of people a lot of money that you pay on your levies and your every month only for it to go to a landfill because it, no one wants it. So China wouldn't take it, so then it got diverted to Indonesia and Vietnam, uh, and who have now come out and said, we're stopping this too. And if you want to see the plastics, and you think of this stuff, it goes over, it goes to unregulated recycling facilities or poorly regulated recycling facilities, and then that plastic ends up on the sides of creeks and streams, and it goes downstream, and it goes out in the ocean, and it goes out in the ocean, and ends up in the Pacific Ocean. And that's what's happening right now. Everybody's freaking out. They think that we can eliminate plastic straws, and we're going to solve that problem. Maybe on their planet it'll work, but it's not going to work on this planet. We need to have a solution that says when it's end of life and it can't do anything, we'll take it. We'll burn it, we'll make some electricity out of it, we'll make some steam out of it. And you can use that electricity and steam to recycle the plastics that can actually be recycled. It's an industrial answer to a social problem. Bob? Thank you. Now, Paul, do you think that in the future we got all these scientists out there, decomposable material, you think they'll ever get that up there? And then, you know, you know like everything will be composted? Me, if I can answer that, me and you are headed off in Las Vegas. But you, you think the way the world's changing? There's always new stuff out there. You know, I, I think in, in an ideal world, you could eliminate plastic. Yeah. But when you look at the, the mass of population is not in rural Alberta, right? It's, it's in the big urban. Yeah. you know? I mean, one third of our population in Alberta is us, yeah. and the other two thirds are in Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, and these people that live in downtown Calgary and condos and, and high rises and, and things, how are they going to get their groceries home? And what is that organic tomato and tofu coming in? Well, I've never seen tofu in a paper bag, but I, I'm sure that you know you need to put it in your pocket, take it home. But I, I think it's the idea is to create efficiencies and. And so stuff that's contaminated, just bite the bullet and say, you know, we're not getting rid of it, so let's deal with it the most efficient way that we can uh, and do the best thing that we can. Yes, we can get rid of landfills, but you're not gonna get rid of landfills unless you have energy from waste. In my opinion, yeah, I'm not a scientist. I just wonder. But they're scientists, so you know what yeah. they say, we gotta believe, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, any other questions? What about what? Well, we'll figure something. Still didn't catch it here when he said he didn't bring it I'm sure he will, yes. <laughs> if there's no other questions, we can use it and we'll go to camera then. Claus? All in favor?